<laughs> es que yo tengo pánico. <laughs> Hello. I'm, I'm fine. It's always fine when I, when I see you. Okay. Yeah. So, Jan, uh, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about you, who you are, um, uh, what your job is, how long you have been doing it, and everything you want to tell us about you? Mm. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> okay. Um, apart from being a world citizen and a chocolate lover, um, I am... Uh, a, a spiritual counselor to say so in a hospital right now and coordinator of Without Walls, a small foundation. But in a previous life, I was a, a teacher. Although after two years of teaching, I left Belgium and uh, I went to Latin America as a development worker. And after South America, I made it to Africa. I would say that working with glue sniffing street kids was my path to the prisons. My, my first prison contacts though were with political prisoners during the dictatorship in Chile. And currently I work uh, what I said part-time in a hospital, mainly in palliative care, and part-time with perpetrators and victims. All right. And um, you know the EPA um, is very, um, really wants to uh, uh, address teachers in prison. So could you tell us when or how, when and how you, you realized that your place was in prison and, and why does the, the, the world prison attract you so much? Well, that, that's interesting um, because my life, eh, the nest in, in which I grew up, my passion for, for beauty and harmony was at odds with the prison world. Never thought I would ever feel at home uh, behind bars. And let it be clear, the filth and sadness of prisons still repel me. But it is the person behind bars and walls that fascinates me. When I came into contact with the prisoner, I soon discovered that our lives, that of the perpetrator, the victim, and other civilians were intertwined. We can only build that just and more equal world if we stay connected with each other. I dearly believe that we must be restored together. And to help prove that, that every human being is much more than his worst act. And because I wanted to understand even better what it is to be deprived of your freedom, I traveled the world to stay in prisons. And until then, I had worked um, voluntarily in prisons, but rarely had eaten there and never had slept there. The first night during my world trip in a prison in Rwanda changed my life forever. I call for every lawyer, every judge, every prison warden, every caregiver, every prison teacher, to spend several days and nights behind bars. Because that um, <laughs> rarely happens at the moment. I already invite people 
through reading books, uh, and that's where Hotel Prison and Hotel Pardon came from, to put us in the shoes of prisoners and victims. Okay. Yeah, well, I, um, I would like to um, invite everyone uh, to read your books because they are really interesting. I must say we know, we've known each other already for eight years and every time we can, we meet and you all are full of uh, interesting stories. Your books are full of interesting stories as well. And it's always lovely to listen to you and your, all your adventures. I don't know if you could share uh, one of your most heartwarming stories with the audience of the EPA. And then the rest they can find back in your books, of course. <laughs> Maybe Anna uh, and Thomas, uh, this is something that I have to add to my former answer, that ever since I made it into that world of prisons, I had to have that privilege to meet wonderful people. So you can count yourself amongst them. But then, yeah, the uh, heartwarming stories, because uh, there are hundreds, but there is one particularly that uh, um, keeps on inspiring me and questioning myself. Where am I at the level of um, restoration and even forgiveness? And uh, here, here it comes. When I was in the Itaúna prison in Brazil, I shared the cell with uh, Diego. And he had been there for about five years for the murder of a taxi driver. For the past two years, he has had a weekly visit from the taxi driver's family. Now, what had happened Diego learned in prison that the widow was suffering from a life-threatening kidney disease. The only outcome was a kidney transplant. But no suitable donor was found in the entire province of Minas Gerais. Diego underwent medical testing and was found to be compatible. He donated a kidney of himself to the widow of the man he murdered years before. That's really a great story. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And um, now that we are busy uh, with restoration and, um, and positive uh, stories about prison, Jan, wh what do you think the main objective of education in prison should be? Um, just like the objective of education to court. Education in prisons should be, above all, uh, this. Developing the capacity to empathize with someone else. Self-development I think, is always in function of others. You are needed for a better world. All courses, trainings, and workshops, be it cooking, languages, or computer programs, they all transform a person into a better fellow man. It, it trains your capabilities and, and broadens the opportunities for the labor and other markets. 
this is crucial, I believe, for every teacher. Does my transfer, my passing of knowledge and skills contribute to the happiness of this prisoner, of this person sitting in front of me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's nice. But if I, if I hear you talking, uh, I'm also a teacher in prison. I've been teaching in prison for the last 10 years. And um, I would say most of the teachers are very motivated uh, when it comes uh, to teaching in prison. But we usually clash with a very uh, strict uh, system. And um, at least uh, uh, what I teach, so what do you think, from your point of view, where do you see the greatest need for, for reform in the prison system? Or what do you think uh, that uh, should happen to have a better prison system? Mm. Um, when, when I was studying to become a teacher, differentiation was fairly new and little by little the the concept ends up on the work table of prison reformers we have to get away um, from that how can i call it unitary sausage huh? several square meters for 700 prisoners with crimes as varied as uh, llamas and penguins in Chile, eh? petty theft, fraud, sex crimes, drug offenses, rape, they put them all together. And I believe that tailor-made care is a must. For that, we have to go to a smaller scale, little prisons, what I'm saying, little houses. Um, most prison charters state that inmates have the same rights as all other citizens, notwithstanding their freedom. That's it. So then, Watch over the health, the health care. Watch over their nutrition, over the hobbies and sports, their relationships, their sexuality, about their education. Studies have long proven that these investments yield much more than high walls and thousand of cameras. It is our duty to be more aware of the enormous potential of talent that prisoners harbor. Invest in training prison staff and involve the inmates, family and friends in the whole recovery program. As a member of Without Walls, my heart goes out to all that includes restorative justice, like possible encounters for recovery with the victim. And maybe on, on an extra personal note, um, create quiet spaces in prisons where people can catch their breath, where the spiritual dimension of prisoners can be addressed and um, where attention is paid for what um, transcends us, if I may say so. All right, I love your ideas. I hope we can sit back here in 10 years and we can see uh, a huge difference uh, between the situation now and the situation in some years. Um, Jan, uh, I want to ask you a last question. 
Um, I would like to ask you if you would like to come tell us about your travels and experiences in prison who, uh, in some future EPA conference. When the... <laughs> <laughs> I, like my pleasure. You, would you like to come and tell us in uh, real time? Because uh, I, I... you're lovely on, the, on TV, but uh, I know if you're close uh, in real person, you're even better. So... Uh, <laughs> Okay, my pleasure, my honor. Uh, but that is if I'm not locked up in a prison at the time. <laughs> Otherwise, we will speak to the director, and uh, we, uh, we'll, we will ask you to um, to get a, to get some permission for two or three days. We'll be all right. Are there any plans? Are there any plans of uh, well, we have to. And yeah, and not not just a, a, a virtual uh, conference. Are you planning of getting together? Yeah, yeah, because you know, we the 25th of, of March we had uh, that online conference, and eh? it was, it was an alternative for our uh, hug. And today we, we had the evaluation. What was interesting because one of the questions was, Would you in the future pr prefer? An online conference eh? or physical, eh? uh, uh, or would you uh, choose to have, or would you have the possibility to choose? And the majority uh, chose that one. So, uh, the possibility to choose. Physically or not. But you had a, a very nice uh, platform, and I guess somebody was doing it for you because it looked quite professional. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that was they paid for it. Yeah, she, well, but she she did a good job. Yeah, really. Of course, we, yes. We, but I was we there. Have done it ourselves. Yeah. I was there and I and I saw it was uh, quite good. In fact, we could also do. But I also I think uh, you have to you you have to choose. And I think um, I would say uh, I would wait, but then I would do the conference physically as soon as uh, as is possible and it's safe. And everybody's going to be willing to go out and meet people again. So yeah. you know, we have a long after party afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, yeah, because if we had done it physically, uh, we could host only 200 people. Yes. Whereas now there were 500 people who attended the conference that night and more than 300 watched it later. So you reached 800 people and, um, and even our partners, in Liberia, in Singapore, they attended the, the conference that night. Yeah. But um, I think it's a good idea to what you're saying that we could we could uh, we could offer it so, in some way. We can also offer the possibility to follow it from home with a very uh, little rage or whatever. And uh, people who cannot come, they could still follow it. That's a very good idea. We could uh, pass it to the EPA meeting, Thomas, because I think it's very it's a very good one. And
And, and other, and another advantage, uh, Anna, was there were a few mothers who attended and, and who said, um, now we could participate um, because um, uh, putting the kids uh, <laughs> to bed, uh, but I, could, I wouldn't have been able to go out to attend the co a conference. Um, but from home, there was no problem. Yeah, for sure, it's a very good idea. So I'm also uh, uh, now you you mentioned it. I think we you should do some kind of of stuff, not yeah. three days, but, uh, but probably some some of the speeches, some of the workshops, or something we could do. And people are, yeah. are getting used to work with uh, with uh, computers and stuff like this. So some of some of the speakers could uh, use uh, Zoom or whatever and make a presentation uh, at the same time. But it doesn't take away. Uh, okay. oh, are you still in? Are okay. you still interviewing? Thomas, can you can you do the official? Uh, of, um... I'll do that. Promise, promise. <laughs> Welcome.